It's nice to see uh, some of you back again, and new faces also. Our topic tonight is the Kundalini, which is a rather esoteric topic, but I will probably talk about it in a more everyday manner, because that is, for me at least, the most effective way even to understand these very inward topics is to approach them from a practical, everyday way. Um, this morning we were having a conversation and we were talking about the inclination of people, especially Indian audiences, to ask um, unanswerable questions of, of a very theoretical nature and my ever-expanding effort to respond appropriately to such questions. And just um, to make breakfast interesting, do you need to flip a switch here? Okay. Will it just hang nicely? Yeah. Okay. Just to make breakfast interesting, the question was asked, why did God make us so stupid? If the intention is to realize God, why, does it, why is it so hard to do so? I mean, this is, you know, this is one of the list of the 25 questions that are often asked uh, for which the answer is impossible. Um, Vivekananda had the final word on that question. Um, the level of consciousness that asks the question is not capable of understanding the answer. Having been asked that question dozens of times over the course of 40 years, I understand the impatience that caused him to come up with that. The answer on my side is, I don't know why he did it. But I started reflecting. Um, th there are ideas that I've heard Swami Kriyananda say many, many times over the years because he, he taught hundreds of hours, and those of us who had the opportunity to meet him young and spend many years with him heard him teach over and over in many different cities and different countries and to different audiences. And I could tell when he would talk that certain ideas were crystal clear to him, and he was trying very hard to say them to us. And often I would hear the same thing for 15 years before I would finally understand it. Well, this morning I understood something that I'd heard him talk about so often that I'm going to launch out today and see if I can say it to you. And it's directly related to the Kundalini, and it's directly related to why did God make us so stupid. Um, we have this idea in our mind, I started really trying to think about that question, that what we really wish that we had when we say we want, we imagine that if we were not blinded by whatever it is that blinds us, if God made it easier to see his presence, the picture we have in our mind is not really God realization. It's that we would get to live in this world pretty much the way we're living, except it would all work better. And I don't think that's what, a, what most people are asking, but there's a sense of tension in the world. And then we start talking about the spiritual path, the joy, the ease, the sense of being loved by God. And I think what we project is that I get to be pretty much myself, except all the icky parts are kind of taken away. It's a little bit like the most naive Christian idea of heaven. Swami Kriyananda speaks sometimes about the Christian idea of heaven is that you live in heaven in a body pretty much like this one, except being among the saved, everything is like beautiful and you get to sing hymns, but you're still essentially your same ego and you get to live like that for eternity. So Amiji said, if that's not the definition of hell, I don't know what is, <laughs> which is just to be trapped in this ego forever. But when we start thinking in little ways about how we'd like God to make it easier for us, what we really, I mean, whether we realize it or not, we want the life as we know it to be easier. 
not so much struggle. The people we love love us back. You know, nobody dies unexpectedly. We get the house that we like, whatever it might be. So I was answering the question with what I know to be the true answer, which is that if God made it easier, the creation would evaporate. Because in order for creation to exist, you have the power of Satchitananda, which is the infinite force which, of which everything is made. And then you have something that pulls away from that whole uh, realization of that. In a sense, it, it turns its back on it and moves in this direction. We can never separate ourselves from that infinite reality because that infinite reality is everything, whether we perceive it or not. Um, as we awaken, as our awareness increases, what we begin to recognize more and more is that all these seeming differences resolve themselves into one reality. Swami Kriyananda made a statement once. Um, as it happened, it was here in India. It was satsang he was giving at the house he had in Gorgang, Guru Kripa. And he just said, because this world is so complicated and because we think of God, however we perceive that, to be the source of all of this, we naturally think that because this world is so complicated, God must be the ultimately complicated because he's the biggest dimension of this world. He said, in fact, it's exactly the opposite. The closer we get to the center, the more everything resolves until it becomes utterly singular. The, the, the creation is complex, but the source is, is complete simplicity. Now, when we are manifested out from creation, however, I, I mean, Swamiji may have been able to see these realities. I can only describe them in words. When we're manifested out, we take that simplicity and we, we pull it out in all directions. The divine pushes it out in all directions, and he, they say he vibrates. And so everything is dual because from stillness, becomes movement, and movement makes all this complexity. Now, in order for us to exist as individuals, there has to be a certain tension away from the source. If we were completely, uh, if, if nothing in us pulled in the opposite direction, then we would simply be pulled back in. I was asked and have been asked, you know, when does soul evolution start? Well, first of all, Actually, the soul never evolves because it never devolves. It, it's never different. But the image that I like the best to answer that question is when you think of the way water seeks a flowing river, a stream, it always it seeks the ocean. R water moves toward the ocean. And there's no point in which that water is not moving toward the ocean. As soon as it emerges from the earth and is perceivable as water, and perhaps even in the underground rivers, it's being pulled in one direction and it just keeps going in that direction. So if it exists, it's moving back to its source. We are always moving back to our source. The question is, how forcefully, how consciously, or, or how much are we pulling away from that source or how much are we pulling, moving back toward that source? It's very hard to conceive of the life of an avatar, understanding that confusing balance between the fact that there's, there was no reason, there was no outwardly propelling reality for that avatar to be born, and yet he has this incarnation that seems to be characterized by the same kind of forces that characterize our life. I've tried to think of different images that help describe it. One of them I think of is as if there was a high, impenetrable brick wall between us and the perception of infinity. And we come into manifestation, and it's like we're thrown over that wall into this world. 
You know, just like there's somebody on the other side who just picks us up and tosses us over the wall. And when we begin our incarnation as little babies, you know, immediately all of our energy is reaching out. I'm sure many of you are parents and you know that as soon as your little child, the teeniest little baby is in your arms, it begins to relate and often reaches up. I, I've never had children of my own, but I was there with when one of my dear friends had has his baby daughter and within seconds that child had reached up and had grabbed his father's finger. I mean, he, he, she knew enough to reach, she knew enough to hold on, and she was, you know, five minutes old. It's like we're, we're thrown over the wall and we immediately turn our back to the wall and begin to be really interested in all this stuff out here. And it looks really shiny, really attractive. It pulls on our heart, it pulls on our ideas, and we don't understand that the light is coming from back here, and what we're seeing is the reflection of that light. We just see that light and reach for it. That's exactly what we're doing. The, the avatar comes over the wall. He flies over the wall. He's not thrown over the wall. He immediately turns his face back to the wall and begins burrowing through it, right? We're out here. We don't even know the wall is there, what to speak, that the point is to go back this way. So he turns around immediately. You read Autobiography of a Yogi, and he talks about his devotions from a very young age and how his mother guided him and how he meditated. And you hear about Lahiri Mahashaya, who Babaji said, I saw you when you were a tiny child meditating for hours. Even in their um, youngest age, they, they're always faced in the right direction and they're always pushing back toward where they came from, whereas we're going in exactly the opposite direction. Now, this compelling force to go in the opposite direction is the way we're made. Because if there's going to be a creation, there has to be a push away from the source. This is what I, I somehow saw this morning when the question was raised. If God made it easier for us, it would all just sweep back in. There's no us if it's easier. Because as soon as that delusion, if that delusion did not exist, there would be no creation. There's no middle ground, which is the one we're looking for, where we get to have our egos, we get to have this individual satisfaction, but it's just easier. Right? It either exists or it doesn't exist. Now, this force that pushes us, that causes us to turn our back and, to, and that stretches us out all the way into material world, that's <coughs> That is the kundalini energy. And this whole project that we call raising the kundalini is to break the hold that this outward moving energy has so that we can simply, at least, at the very least, turn back toward the wall, but also begin to burrow into it, burrow through it in the, in the image that I'm using. Now, I'm, I'm sure if you think about it, you can all feel it in the way that, that all of us feel it. Part of us is aspiring, and part of us just really does want to be free. But the other part of us loves our wife, loves our children, loves our comforts, loves our pretty clothes, loves our nice house, still wants to go to Sweden, still wants to go to Alaska and see the Aurora Borealis or whatever it might be. That's just wants to do a certain kind of good work, feels a compelling need for thousands of things. Um, all of those are the force of the kundalini all the way to the base of the spine that cause us to be interested in the outside world. Now, it, it gets a little complicated. It's not as kind of clear and clean cut as that. 
and I can't go all the way back to the beginning of creation, which is what, and please don't anybody ask me tonight this question, you know, why did it ever get started in the first place? Swamiji's answer is a fascinating one, really, which I will touch, I'll answer it in advance. He was giving a radio interview in Los Angeles not too many years ago, and the announcer, this, it, I mean, at the end of his life, when he was 84, 85, and the announcer asked him if he was a happy man, meaning the implication of that is, you have lived a life very different than many people have lived. Did it work for you? Are you a happy man? Swamiji answered in the way he often does, which is that many people will say they are happy because even if they're not, they don't like to admit it. Or they just de decide that whatever I'm experiencing must be happiness. So he answered it more subtly. He said, the, it's the nature of happiness. Uh, the, the, a truly happy man wants to make everyone in the world as happy as he is. And that's, it was an interesting way to say it, because many people have a certain life that they're living, but they don't necessarily recommend it to everyone. You know, I became a successful business magnate, or I was a, a doctor, or I was a professor, but they don't go around saying to everybody in the world, you must do this. This is really going to give you everything that you're looking for. The only people who ever say that are the saints, because the saints understand that the happiness and reality that they have found will work for everyone. So in that same way, it's the nature of a happy man. And he said, by that criteria, he said, I'm a very happy man. I've devoted my life to trying to make everyone, help everyone to experience what I experience, really, of divine bliss. Now, as to why God made creation in the same way, the nature of the infinite spirit is such it ananda. It's ever existing, ever conscious, ever new bliss. It's the nature of bliss to want to share itself. Again, Swamiji is very common sense in explaining that. I think I mentioned this already. You find a very nice restaurant or a really good movie, and you get on your cell phone and you tell your friends. Now, it may be that your friends will go to that restaurant and they won't like the food, or they'll go to the movie and they won't like the movie. And so the experience that you had that you're trying to share, they may not actually have that same experience, but your expanded happiness or joy in sharing it with them is not diminished merely because it didn't work for them. And so the divine, the Satchitananda manifesting this creation to enjoy himself through many. And the obvious answer is he's not enjoying himself through very many. But to enjoy himself through many is because it's the nature of bliss to want to share itself. One of Swami Kriyananda's the many aspects of his genius as a teacher was that he could take something as esoteric as that and he could relate it to an experience that every single one of us knows. God made creation for the same reason that you tell your friends about a movie that you like. I mean, on one level, it seems an absurd comparison. But on another level, it begins to give us um, a, a way that we can tune in to these realities. Now, the other half, and bringing it back to the Kundalini and, and manifesting in the material world, um, Master says that when the sperm and the ovum unite. He said, there's a flash of light in the astral world, and all those souls that are in tune with the quality of that flash of light, for whom it is time to reincarnate, will move toward um, that um, material union in order to be able to, to have a body and to, to live there. Master actually said, they, they, rush, they rush toward it and try to crowd in, is how he put it, and sometimes more than one gets in. Very interesting story. I'll tell you a story. A friend of mine, when I, she heard me say this, she talked about her son, who was, now, who was grown at the time that we had this conversation. 
But she said when he was five, um, he became very displeased with her, as children can be. And because he was so angry, he stomped out of the room and he said, you know, Mother, I don't like you at all. And then he goes out of the room. And then he thinks about it and he comes back to her and he says, you weren't even my first choice. That's what he says to her. <laughs> and, and she was so intrigued. She didn't know anything at that time about these teachings. She said, well, darling, who was your first choice? And then he declared quite emphatically, a lady in the Philippines, but she was taken, is what he said. <laughs> so when this, this was, no, this was the child's conversation with his mother. So when she heard me say what I just said to you, the flash of light and the soul's rush to get in, she told me this story and she said what was so amusing to her is that her son has a characteristic that he still has, which is he'll make up his mind to do something, he'll go toward it, but he'll often just hesitate, just at the last, stop and think it over before he goes forward. She says she can just see him in the astral world, heading for that lady in the Philippines, <laughs> stopping just to think about it, and while he stopped and think about it, somebody else got the womb. Just like that. <laughs> Amazing. Now, this, this is a, a powerful thought, just in any case, about you know the conception of a child, and Swamiji actually... Uh, and Master talks about this, about how you can consciously call um, the soul, uh, a, a high-minded soul into your family because the quality of that flash of light has an effect. Now, of course, the quality of that flash of light is the sum total of your consciousness. You can't just cheat in the last second like that. But nonetheless, by, by deliberate concentration and divine awareness, you can call high-minded souls into your family, which is really a... a marvelously interesting thought. But as soon as the sperm and ovum unite and the life force enters the presence of the soul, which is also it, the question often asked, when does the soul enter? Well, Master says, at the moment of conception. Because until the soul is present, there's no life force. It's just matter. I mean, the power to turn that single cell into the bodies that we now live in requires that an individual consciousness commit to it. That's where the intelligence comes from. But the first thing that happens is that from that first cell, which Master says is right here at the medulla, and those of you who learn the energization exercises and so on understand the importance of this, the first thing that happens is that the spine is created. In other words, the energy goes from, from the medulla, which is actually the same chakra as the spiritual eye, and it goes down the spine to the bottom of the spine. Because that's the commitment that the soul made. The soul makes the commitment that it's going to live in a material body, it's going to manifest a material body, it's going to have this complete experience. In other words, it removes itself from the causal, from the astral, from the ideational and energetic world, and it enters the material world. It pulls away from the source. And there's a, a tremendous force that does that, and that force remains in place. And the degree to which it defines and dominates the incarnation you live has to do with the quality of the energy all through those chakras. So the, if you, when you look at the little books of the developing embryo, you'll see there's a stage, and I don't know how they ever get these pictures, but there's a stage where the, the developing baby looks like a matchstick because what it has, all it has is from the top of the spine to the bottom of the spine. And it's interesting that, you know, a human being can lose everything. You can just be nothing but a matchstick, but you can't be smaller than the physical corresponding points of those chakras. You know, if you lose any, if you, if you go past essentially the trunk to the top of the head, the life force is gone. You can't, but you can live without everything else because that is your essential nature. And once we make that, and we make that commitment to the material world for an extremely interesting and fundamental reason, which is that we believe that it's going to make us happy. Master says that there's only two motivating forces in all of creation, and that is the desire for bliss which is the, the drop of water trying to get back to the ocean, 
and the corollary of that, which is the desire to escape suffering. And every single decision that we make, we believe, is going to bring us one or the other of those realities. And the mere fact that we incarnate in a physical body, the reason we do that is because we believe that there is a happiness potential here for us. And we're driven to seek that happiness potential. That's why the little baby, as soon as it's born, reaches out. It reaches out to experience the material world. And the whole progression of an incarnation is to become more and more conscious. Now, people who are, have their backs to the spirit and are looking only at the material world, which we know people like that, they never consider the, they're just driven in this way. In other words, the, at the beginning of the incarnation, the energy descends to the base of the spine, which is the earth chakra, and it just stays there. And nothing that the person ever does um, changes the direction of that flow of energy. I don't mean that the energy is always flowing down, but the commitment to that reality never shifts. Okay? And it never shifts because we think that there's something here that is really going to satisfy us. And that's, that's how we live. We think we, we need money to live. We think we need family to live. We think we need houses to live. And the, the examples that change that are great saints and yogis, of which there are many examples in your culture, of people who just don't need those things. So, uh, so our master tells a story in Autobiography of a Yogi of the policemen who were seeking a violent criminal, and they saw a sadhu and thought that he was the criminal. And remember, they pursue him, and then he wouldn't stop. So the policeman slices off his arm, which seems a rather extreme gesture in the moment, but he slices off the yogi's arm, and the yogi just turns, and there's been no conversation, and says, I'm not the man you're seeking. He picks up his arm and he puts it back. Now, this man is not living in relationship to the material world like the rest of us are living. We have examples like Therese Neumann, who's in Autobiography of a Yogi, who lived without eating or drinking for many, many years. She had a physical body, but the whole orientation of that physical body, she was not pulling out into the material world like most of us are. So the whole process that is, is really quite esoteric of the raising of the kundalini is the way in which we lessen our commitment to have to experience life through the, the material plane only, and the more we can make our experience of life more, more expanded, very different than that. So we think of the kundalini raising, and it's a perfectly valid way to think about it, you know, we're doing Kriya, we're having a meditation, all of a sudden we feel energy in the spine, raising up to the spine, and the thousand-petaled lotus opens up the spiritual eye, and all of that is true. And that is, in fact, you know, the raising of the kundalini. But every single minute of our life, we are either um, having that energy com commit to the material world, or we are, we are gradually breaking that commitment and redirecting the energy in an upward way. Um, and it's important for us to understand that we were having a conversation before 7 o'clock when some of you came in about the life that we are living right now. I mean, all of you. You know, there's not a cave-dwelling yogi among us. There's not one of us who's been freed sufficiently to be able to live in a material body, but with such a light connection to the material world. Most of you have come from the jobs that you hold. You're probably half thinking about the children or the family that you've left at home, um, all the people who are part of your household, all the... We, we're, even right now, as you all know, this ashram is going to be moving to another location. That location is being remodeled. I visited the house with Daya and Keshava yesterday. They were over there today. Just the massive physicality of revising that house, just the sheer 
square inches of tile and concrete and plumbing supplies and light. And it's just this, it's a hugely physical reality that absolutely has to be dealt with. And I was longing for the simplicity of a cave. You know, it's not even my responsibility. And I felt just buried under the sheer physicality of it. All of us are buried under the sheer physicality of the world that we have to live in. But what we have to appreciate is that Yogananda also had a physical body, tra took that body to another country, traveled around that country, built a big organization, built buildings, designed them, made material decisions. But he was never trapped and identified with the material world, and he never had the illusion that where his happiness would come from was in, in any way connected or dependent upon, is the right word, that physical expression. So for the kind of yogis that we are now, we can't just think in terms of breaking that connection. If we were that free, we wouldn't be living here. <laughs> you know, we would be gone from all of this. If we didn't have anything to learn or anything to, to serve in this situation, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing it. So in order to raise our kundalini, we can't disconnect from the earth chakra, but we have to live completely in this world, but always with our energy moving upward. In other words, we have to imitate the master Instead of doing what, what pushes our energy away, we have to turn and face the wall and make sure that everything we're doing in this world is burrowing back into the divine. Does that make sense? It's an, it's an extremely important difference because otherwise we become divided up. We become at war with ourselves. And I've never yet seen that to be beneficial where we have one life, one set of demands, and we're always wishing we had another life and another set of demands. I remember many years ago in the, in the early years of our life at Ananda Village, we were very impoverished. We had very little money. I was talking about this in the class on prosperity, actually. And for me personally, I realized at a certain point in my life that it it made me feel safe spiritually to be poor. It wasn't really that I had material desires because I've not really been that strongly interested in money or things ever. But as long as I was poor, I was sure that I was spiritual. And I got married and my husband had a, has a very different attitude. His perspective is that everything in the world is energy. And it doesn't really matter whether that energy is being expended toward business or toward meditation or, you know, service or who, whatever it is. It's all just energy. And if it's flowing in the right direction, that's what it is. And we came into this position where, for various reasons, Swami Kriyananda asked us to move next door to where he lived at Ananda Village. And in order to do that, we had to build a house, a small house. For those of you who have been to Ananda Village, it's the guest house of Crystal Hermitage now. And so my husband accepted that responsibility quite easily, and we started designing. It's a, small, it's a small house, but it's a very nicely done. But I felt that I just I couldn't participate in the building of that house because it violated my idea of what it was to be spiritual. And after a few weeks, he finally said to me, if you're not going to help, at least get out of the way, is what he asked me. <laughs> And I had to stand back and ask myself, now, my fear of involvement in the spiritual world, in the material world, was not the same as transcending the material world. And in fact, fear is as powerful a glue as attraction, isn't it? When we're afraid of something, we're, we're totally embroiled in it. And so my fear of participating creatively and dynamically in the flow of energy required to build a house, in my own mind, was my way of moving the kundalini up the spine. But in fact, as Swamiji put it in another context, you don't get out of karma by doing it badly. 
Those were his words. You, know, you don't get out of it just by, by blocking the energy. You get out of it by moving through it with freedom. And this is an extremely important aspect of the spiritual path, that the spiritual path is not desi- uh, defined by any specific behavior. It's defined by inner freedom. So Master could live in a beautiful place at Mount Washington. He could design it exactly the way he wanted. He could be delighted to live there. And he, but, but his energy was never moving away from the spirit, even when he was participating in the material world. His energy was always free. Swami Kriyananda, whom we you know, saw, many of us saw, very up close for many years, he was absolutely committed to manifesting um, the community aspect, among others, of Paramahansa Yogananda's work. But that was never... His energy was never moving away from the divine in doing it. His energy was always moving toward the divine because it was a commission from his guru, a responsibility he took on for one reason and one reason only, which was to be a good disciple. Okay? So we have to understand that what causes the energy to become more and more committed to the earth chakra, so to speak, which stretches us out away from the spirit, is not what we do, but what, we f- what we're thinking, what we are feeling about what we are doing, what is motivating us, what is the real intention of the heart. When I first came to Ananda community, my interest in being there was entirely Swami Kriyananda. I mean, it was nice that there was a community, it was a very nice place to live, it was fun. Uh, we were running a retreat. It gave us an opportunity to help people. But, but I had an extremely singular focus. It, wherever he was, I was going to be. If he had walked away from there, I would have followed him. It made no, it had no effect on me. In my, in my way of thinking, this was a superior spiritual attitude because I was so indifferent to the material plane, I was only focused on Swami Kriyananda. However, I noticed that Swami Kriyananda was quite focused on the community and quite focused on manifesting on the material plane this particular ideal of masters. And one day, literally, I was in the back of the car and we were driving through the community and I was looking out the window. Swamiji was either driving or in the front seat. And it crossed my mind that his commitment um, was likely represented a deeper spiritual understanding than my indifference. And, and I thought that also he was being such a good friend to me spiritually and I was not being a very good friend to him. He was helping me with what I wanted to know, which was how to grow spiritually, but I was not helping him with what he was trying to do, which was to manifest this community. So I had to begin to understand how you participate in the material world and still have that participation be lifting your kundalini energy instead of um, sinking it. And again, I realized that my refusal to expand my understanding of what it was to be spiritual actually was locking my energy rather than freeing it, okay? The, our spiritual life must be defined in imitation of those souls who have achieved the spiritual freedom that we're trying to achieve. And that's uniquely expressed through different lines of masters. It's uniquely expressed by every devotee but nonetheless, there, are, there is this quality of bliss, and there's also this quality of freedom, which is really a fundamental part of it. So we have to begin to ask ourselves, you know, what actions tie us up in material concerns and what actions free us, um, and what attitudes free us. And the, for, for many of us, of course, meditation is self-evident, and I'm... 
I haven't talked yet about Kriya or about meditation and the role that it plays, partly because it's the most obvious answer. Okay, when, when we meditate, when we put our energy at the spiritual eye, what, what we're dealing with, the chakras are magnetic fields of energy. And magnetic fields of energy respond to each other according to the force that's being exerted. Um, the more we are interested and committed to the material plane, the stronger those vortices of energy are in those places in our spine that correspond to lust or greed or, or, or food or whatever it might be, money, power, all of those things represent a certain pulling away from the spiritual reality and committing our energy to a lesser vibration. But those things that lift our energy, I, when we concentrate our attention in meditation here at the spiritual eye, what happens is that this energy, literally, we just simply build magnetism at this point, and every vritti of energy that has less force pulling away is, is drawn up into the, the greater force that we're creating here. This is the entire principle of Kriya. And this is why Kriya Yoga is able to dissolve our karma and change our spiritual life. Because through the process of Kriya, what we do is we generate more and more magnetism at the spiritual eye. And it's exactly like a river that's flowing and a whirlpool that's caught. You know, there's, when, if, if some of the water in the river, which is heading toward the sea, which is the spirit heading back to the infinite, it gets distracted. You know, I'm, it's, I'm, I'm, I want to meditate, but I'm worried about whether my daughter's going to get a job. I want to meditate, but I'm thinking about this thing that I want to buy. And so the energy that's going towards spirit can't go towards spirit because it's caught in a whirlpool here. Now, we get rid of those whirlpools by having a certain experience and learning something. The daughter gets the job, and it still doesn't make her happy, and so we, we're not so worried the next time. Or we buy the house, or we buy the car, and it, we realize that a car is not really going to make us as happy as we thought. Or we get rid of the whirlpool by increasing the flow of the river. And if the river is flowing stronger than the whirlpool, in other words, if our desire for spiritual freedom and for attunement with God is strong enough, then the whirlpool will just get dissolved into the river. And often we have no idea even that it was there or what it was or we don't have to live through it. This is why Master says, you know, one round of Kriya practiced correctly is the equivalent of one year of living because we can generate energy equivalent to what it would take us if we had to live through all those experiences. The danger of life is that we pick up extra karmas as we go. The advantage of Kriya is that it's, it's all dissolved directly. Now, we can increase the flow of that river also by our life experience in other ways, by our, um, the enjoyment of service, um, the enjoyment of satsang, all of those begin to create magnetism in experiences that are moving back toward the spirit instead of moving away from the spirit, which is why you get on the spiritual path and immediately you start, we start thinking about what experiences pull our energy down and what experiences raise our energy up. And that's why we want, want you to come and meditate in a group. It's why we ask you to be generous with your with your money, which is why we ask you to serve. We, meaning why the masters make all these recommendations, that you become lighter in your diet, that you um, no longer bring into your consciousness things that attach you to the material world. All of these are done quite simply so that we can create the magnetism in the higher chakras. And then when that magnetism begins to grow, then the, the, the experience uh, the positive experience of that freedom quite simply makes us desire more of it. You know, that, that, that's really how the spiritual path works. There's a, a vibration that we get into that we recognize 
as the one that we were seeking in all those other experiences. Yogananda puts it, he says, there reaches a point in our incarnations when this world assumes a certain anguishing monotony, is what he called it. I, I love that word, because even tragedy is sort of interesting. You know, there's energy if you're coping with something really dramatic. But what really gets to us in the end is just the anguishing monotony of it. And I, I know that on my own spiritual journey, that was, that, was the, um, that was the fear that I had as a young person, is that I was just going to end up somehow in what I, I already knew was just going to be another round, another round of the same old experience. And it was just, you know, it was very scary to me that I, I would just get caught, even though I didn't even want to go there. I, I didn't know how I, I wouldn't go there. Okay? Now, all of our energy, whether we, wherever it's flowing, and this is an aspect of it, it's all kundalini energy. It's just either trapped in the material plane. And you know, the, um, the pull that we feel toward the, the world is very, uh, it's very complicated. And we, we have to work with this freeing, freeing up of the kundalini energy, is what I would call it. We have to work at it from both sides. Um, but you can't really make it successfully merely by rejecting. And this is where Swamiji said to me, you, know, you, can't, you can't get free of karma just by doing it badly. You can't just reject. It's, it's much more effective to add in what you're trying to become rather than always thinking about what you don't want to be. Because it, sometimes, it, remember the story of the, the two monks who were walking, and at a certain point there was a, uh, they had to ford a river, and there was a woman there who wasn't strong enough to cross the river on her own, so the monk picked her up and carried her across, put her down on the other side. Three miles later, the, the second, second monk says, how could you, a monk, pick up that woman? He says, well, I put her down miles ago, and you've been carrying her this whole distance. <laughs> so the thought sometimes in our minds of worrying about what we don't want to do often ties us to it much more strongly than if we simply put our energy toward where we want to go. Swami Kriyananda, again, his guidance of us was so effective and so subtle in so many ways, and he had a very simple one which was go with your strengths. He had, rather than tell us what we shouldn't do, he tended to try to find that place where the energy was already flowing. And then by simply by increasing that, it, it, it started energy moving in the right direction. Once the river begins, begins to flow, all of the little vortices that are smaller than that flow of energy will grow. So I, I was talking to a woman once, and she was having what I called, what I said to her, the good news is, I said, you are having a 100% collapse, which means that when it's over, you'll be able to entirely rebuild your life. She was having money problems. She was having health problems. She was having relationships problems. She was having job problems. It was, it was a lot. And it was so much that she just, you know, just couldn't figure out what to do about anything. Her energy was completely pulled away from spiritual reality and utterly trapped in the conditions of her life. Desperately, I prayed for something that could help her. I said, is there anything in your life that lifts your energy? Because every time our energy is lifted, the kundalini is being freed. It's being freed from uh, rigidity and allowed to flow where it wants to go, which is up to spirit. And she said she enjoyed riding her bicycle. So I said, whenever you begin to feel at all anxious, which is most of the time, about what's going on in your life, just start riding your bicycle. It, even I thought it sounded ridiculous, but it was the only thing I could think of to say. And she started actually doing that, because there was nothing else to do. But what happened is, as soon as she began to r ride her bicycle, energy in motion, she began to break the rigidity that was holding her to fear, insecurity, anxiety, lack of faith, 
a little bit of that kundalini energy began to be free to flow back up toward the spirit, as soon as there was a little energy flowing, she got onto a wavelength in which it was possible to see her way out. And so even though it, it didn't seem to have anything to do with anything, it was anything that will free your energy and allow it to rise. The kundalini begins to rise. Your consciousness begins to shift to that extent. And because everything about your life is the perception, the, the, the picture that you're seeing, one of the fundamental qualities of spiritual consciousness, super consciousness, Swamiji describes, is that it's solution-oriented. And that word oriented is a really important word. It's the way things are leaning. When I, uh, in, in my own you know, complex personal psychology, I, I was very insecure about myself, is the only way I could say it. And after 12 years, and I sometimes hesitate to tell you how long it takes, but after 12 years on the spiritual path, which is an astrological cycle, and I was doing Kriya and all of that for 12 years, I felt that my own inner sense of self had been tilted away from my well-being. And so whenever anything would happen, I would call the marble of my mind would roll away from where I wanted it to go. After 12 years of practice, it tipped toward where I wanted to go, which seems like almost nothing, but it was absolutely everything. And super consciousness, which is where we're trying to go, is where all these differences resolve into unity. And the opposite of that is when our energy is locked at the base of the spine and it just keeps moving out into diversity. And of course the solution to whatever ails us is when we can reunify our consciousness with the power of the source. Everything that causes us to suffer, if you stop and think about it, is because in some way or another we feel fragmented and separated from the whole. Isn't that true? I mean, if we come to a beautiful spiritual event, what is it that happens to us? We feel so connected, whether we call that connected to the masters, connected to the spiritual family, connected to our own center, connected to our own strength, whatever it might be, that sense of fragmentation is replaced with a sense of increased well, the word yoga means union, an increased integration. And um, so the more we are oriented toward that uplifted, integrated sense, the more the kundalini energy becomes accessible to us. The material world, by very definition, the nature of matter is that everything seems separate, doesn't it? It's just we seem separate from each other. The carpet is separate from the wall. The microphone is separated from the car outside. The closer we get to the spirit, the more we feel just that flow of energy through everything. Isn't that so? And we feel so close with one another. Uh, we feel a benign attitude toward the whole world. Swami Kriyananda's consciousness was so powerfully affecting all of us because he, when he looked out at us, he, he always, he just saw the, the presence of the Spirit. In fact, he described once, he said he saw all beings, including animals, as he put it. He said they're all just um, Spirit um, becoming more and more free, just on a spectrum, from the least conscious to the most conscious. <coughs> But it was just, it's just one flow of energy, and it's, it's one river all flowing back to the spirit. So whereas we would see ourselves as extremely individual, with that energy pulled all the way down to the base of the spine, identifying me with this body, with its life experiences, with its particular needs, with its particular problems, he would see it as just a flow of energy moving toward infinity. And of course, when we're able to just step back that quarter inch and feel that this is just a role that we're playing, this is just a responsibility that we have, all of that anxiety goes away. Isn't that so? There's a, 
I sometimes advise people when they're very worried about something. No, don't worry. I said something always happens. And I don't mean that something good always happens. I just mean that something always happens. So there's no point in becoming particularly identified and distressed about this because something else is going to happen. And the, the process of the spiritual path is having enough experiences where you know that there's just the river is just going to keep flowing to the sea, no matter what this is. I remember a friend of mine was in just a terrible karmic situation, one of the worst. I mean, it was just terrible, everything in his life. He was being attacked from the outside and from the inside, and nothing was working. He sort of said to Swamiji, just almost wordlessly, what can, what can I do? And Swami's answer, he said, all karma eventually ends. That whatever it is, nothing lasts forever. And odd as that sound, it was very reassuring. Okay, so now all we do is we just go one step after the other. But you see, every time we're faced with any challenge in life, we have a, a, a choice as to which direction we pull the energy. Do we use this as an opportunity to lighten and free the kundalini energy to rise up toward the spirit? Or do we use this as an opportunity to cling all the harder? My money has a problem. My wife has a problem. My house has a problem. I have a problem. Or do we just say, all karma ends. It's just a, we're just flowing toward the sea. The raising of the kundalini is the dramatic freedom that comes to us sometimes in meditation but even the building up to that dramatic freedom is a question of every moment of every day, what reality are we affirming? Are we affirming the fact that we belong to the divine and the divine is always with us? Are we affirming the fact that I am a separate reality and I must hold on to this? There is nothing easy about this. Because for many incarnations, we have been building up that outward commitment. But it's very simple. And it's extremely important on the spiritual path to understand that something is difficult. That If something is difficult, it does not mean it's because it's complicated. And in fact, just the opposite. We sometimes make it complicated because that, allows, that distracts us from the extremely simple reality that we have. A friend of mine who was a mathematician, I'm, I'm, not, inclined to, I'm not inclined toward numbers, but he, he's, he told me that he was an atheist when he started studying math. And the serious study of mathematics turned him into a believer in God. And his explanation was lovely, and I think of it often. He said, in mathematics, if the answer is not harmonious and beautiful, you don't have the right answer. Because that is, from his point of view, what makes mathematics so fascinating is the way it all comes together. So he realized that if a, if a mere math equation always comes out harmonious and beautiful, how could the whole of life be different? And his atheistic philosophy, he said, was neither harmonious nor beautiful. And it occurred to him that he didn't have the right answer. And that caused him to begin to explore in a different way. Well, I've thought of it like this. And this, again, is something that Swamiji said, and it was so dear. I, I think I said it to you the other night, but it's worth repeating. As his own consciousness, Swamiji's became more and more free and more, more infused with bliss, he said, when he would see people suffering, he wouldn't see suffering anymore. He would just see the precursor to bliss. And the more dramatic, in a sense, the suffering, the more beautiful the story was going to be. Isn't, isn't the story where it's all so close and so difficult, but finally they succeed? That's the great story, isn't it? Um, someone was telling me the plot of the movie Gravity, which I don't know if it's in the theaters here now, but, you know, they're lost in space and they have to get back. And then she was adding on, you know, the, this obstacle and this one, and then they're almost free and then there's one more. And, 
You know, in the final end, we say, wow, what a great story. There would have been no story if they'd gone up and come down, right? So when we see all those obstacles to our divine freedom, we tend to see them as the opposite of our divine freedom rather than the necessary um, drama that's going to bring that forward. And so Swamiji said when he sees people suffering, it would intensify his awareness of their bliss because the contrast would be so strong and, as he put it, he knew how much sweeter their freedom would be when it finally came. Now, I've translated this in the simplest way. Unless it's a happy ending, the story isn't over. That's my mathematics friend. If it's not harmonious and beautiful, the story isn't over. And so the way we ourselves keep that energy flowing upward instead of trapping it downward is whenever whenever it's trapped because of fear, anxiety, boredom, low energy, illness, death, whatever it might be, it just says we're not at the end of the story yet. Because sooner or later the light's going to break and the hero is going to triumph. I sometimes, I, I do the what I call the photo captioned commentary on my life. This is the part where the heroine loses hope. <laughs> this is the part where the heroine stumbles and falls and doesn't get up quickly. And you just sort of look at your own life like that. You know, this is the part in which, in which we don't have faith. But then this is the part in which the, the plot changes and we, we start moving forward again. All of raising of kundalini is raising our consciousness by all the methods that we know so that it's not held away from spirit but moving toward it. Just that image that I started with. We come over the wall. Which way are we facing? I often think it doesn't really make any difference where you are on the path. The only thing that matters is which way you are facing. It's not even essential that you be moving, although it's nice if you're moving. Because when you do start moving, if you're facing the right direction, you'll move in the right direction. And you can think of it just that distance in the spine. Is, is, is the energy moving away or is the energy moving toward? And every time we make a decision, which way is this going to move the energy? And uh, whatever, however small, as long as you're facing the right direction, and you're on your way to the happy ending. You're speeding it along. Well, do we have any thoughts or comments or questions? Is raising of the kundalini permanent or does it regress also? It's, well, there is a point at which salva, you know, which you are completely free and there's no more karma left. Um, Swamiji writes that that to be completely free is a very high state of consciousness, but it's like the tide coming in. That's the best way to think about it. The tide will eventually come all the way in, but it doesn't necessarily come in in just one movement. But it's directional. Once we become, once we sincerely and deeply understand that the happiness we, were, we are seeking will be found in the spiritual rather than the material world, then even if we fall back and lose deep connection with that, we can never lose it entirely. Because we have experienced a, a, a more satisfying reality, and even if we retreat from it, it the, the, the memory is there, and sooner or later we, we repudiate this and come back. So. Uh, true spiritual gain is permanent. One of the factors about Kriya Yoga practice in this particular path is that it tends not to be dramatic. It's not like you come for a weekend and everything has changed and now I'm completely different. The gains we make are often almost imperceptible, but you find as time passes you have become completely somebody else. And you, you're not even exactly certain when it happened. But because all the practices, including Kriya especially, you're constantly increasing the flow of the river toward the sea, which is the, the source, the spiritual eye, 
And as the river increases in strength, the vrittis keep moving into the river. And you don't even know that's happening, except you find that the flow of the river is freer and stronger. And more of who you are is going where you want it to go. And so you, you kind of just look around and you realize you're, you're not being pulled. You're not reacting. You're not responding in the same way. And you, as I say, you don't exactly know when you shifted. Um, but once those shifts are made, because the spiritual dimension gives us what we truly are seeking, and we know it when we have it. So we are simply not able to turn away from it because we are all seeking. We don't have to force ourselves. There's, no, there's not even discipline involved. It's, we simply can't. We're not drawn to another reality anymore. It's just a thought. Um, I don't know whether I'm right or wrong. Uh, just help me understand it. Um, isn't it, when you truly love Master with all your heart, this is automatically going to happen? We don't need to? Um, devotion is the greatest power. The question was, if we automatically love Master, won't all this happen? Yes. Um, however, if we love Master, we also need to pay attention to what he has asked us to do. And he added to Guru Bhakti a vast number of other things that we can do to support that energy and to strengthen it. Um, if our devotion is so powerful, it won't occur, we won't need to do anything else. But most of us merely at the first awakening, we still have buried karmas that are likely to sabotage that intention. And we would be wise to be conscientious and not just uh, rely on one aspect, uh, uh, you know, just hope that one thing will work. In principle, devotion is everything. And if we love God enough, if we love Guru enough, everything else, that, that river will be strong enough to flow, to pull all the other um, whirlpools into it. But it doesn't hurt to work on er every dimension of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Were you going to ask a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, the point of stillness also makes you aware of all the souls around you. You feel one of them, part of them, and God. It makes you aware of everything, yes. Every one of us, every soul. Um, that that samadhi or the, the ultimate sahasara uh, opening and feeling that. Samadhi state also, it is not, that's my, I'm, I'm asking actually. It is not a stillness, but it is a, a kind of a super consciousness when we can feel part of all the energy or all the souls in this material world, or they're part of us. The duality that they are individuals, men, and they become. Um, that's, that's a description of, of God realization is when all the illusion of separateness ceases and we recognize the oneness of everything. And we feel it progressively, you see, because uh, a spiritual person, and as we progress spiritually, we become more and more sympathetic toward everyone, more compassionate, more conscious of their needs, more willing to help them, more willing to sacrifice for their welfare, because it's directional. Right. So yes, and we experience it even in our little way until we experience it. Like Master, who says to his disciple, you have a bad taste in your mouth, don't you? Because he's as much in their reality as he is in his own. Definitely. Okay. Well, I think that that will cover the subject as much as we can cover it in this brief time. 
And if you have further questions, I'm happy to answer them, but I think that that is the formal ending of our evening. Thank you all very much.